Well, good morning. I want to tell you about a seven-year-old girl who lost her best friend when she said that the letter A was the most beautiful pink she had ever seen. What does your A look like, she asked. And her friend said, you're weird. And the seven-year-old never again spoke of her rich world in which sounds were moving colored shapes, words had distinct tastes, and the number eight was a fat, arrogant lady. Likewise, many years ago, a new neighbor invited me to dinner. It'll be a few more minutes, he said. There's not enough points on the chicken. His friends laughed and said, oh, Michael, what are you smoking now? But my embarrassed host turned to me and said, well, you're a neurologist. Maybe you'll understand. When I taste something, I, feel, I also feel it in my face and in my hands. A feeling sweeps down my arm, and I feel weight, shape, texture, and temperature as if I'm actually grasping something. Ah, I managed to say, trying to be polite. You have synesthesia. My host exclaimed, you mean there's a name for what I do? Well, after 30 years, things change, and so this little uh, TED-Ed clip will get us up to speed very quickly. Imagine a world in which you see numbers and letters as colored, even though they're printed in black. In which music or voices trigger a swirl of moving colored shapes. In which words and names fill your mouth with unusual flavors. Jail tastes like cold, hard bacon, while Derek tastes like earwax. Welcome to Synesthesia, the neurological phenomenon that couples two or more senses in 4% of the population. A synesthete might not only hear my voice, but also see it, taste it, or feel it as a physical touch. Sharing the same root with anesthesia, meaning no sensation, synesthesia means joint sensation. Having one type, such as colored hearing, gives you a 50% chance of having a second, third, or fourth type. One in 90 among us experience graphemes, the written elements of language like letters, numerals, and punctuation marks, as saturated with color. Some even have gender or personality. For Gale, three is athletic and sporty. Nine is a vain, elitist girl. By contrast, the sound units of language, or phonemes, trigger synesthetic tastes. For James, college tastes like sausage, as does message in similar words with the idge ending. Synesthesia is a trait, like having blue eyes, rather than a disorder, because there's nothing wrong. In fact, all the extra hooks endow synesthetes with superior memories. For example, a girl runs into someone she met long ago. Let's see, she had a green name. Deezer Green, Deborah, Darby, Dorothy, Denise. Yes, her name is Denise. Once established in childhood, pairings remain fixed for life. Synesthetes inherit a biological propensity for hyperconnecting brain neurons, but then must be exposed to cultural artifacts such as calendars, food names, and alphabets. The amazing thing is that a single nucleotide change in the sequence of one's DNA alters perception. In this way, synesthesia provides a path to understanding subjective differences, how two people can see the same thing differently. Take Sean, who prefers blue-tasting foods such as milk, oranges, and spinach. The gene heightens normally occurring connections between the taste area in his frontal lobe and the color area further back. But suppose in someone else that the gene acted in non-sensory areas. You'd then have the ability to link seemingly unrelated things, which is the definition of metaphor, seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Not surprisingly, synesthesia is more common in artists who excel at making metaphors, like novelist Vladimir Nabokov, painter David Hockney, and composers Billy Joel and Lady Gaga. But why do the rest of us non synesthetes understand metaphors like sharp cheese or sweet person? It so happens that sight, sound, and movement already map to one another so closely that even bad ventriloquists convince us that the dummy is talking. Movies, like Lloyd's, convince us that the sound is coming from the actors' mouths rather than surrounding speakers. So, inwardly, we're all synesthetes, outwardly unaware of the perceptual couplings happening all the time. Cross-talk in the brain is the rule, not the exception. And that sounds like a sweet deal to me.
In 1968, A.R. Luria <clears throat> wrote about a five-fold synesthete whose extra hooks gave him essentially a limitless memory. Uh, this year, the stage director, Peter Brook and Marie Helene Estienne wrote a play based on this character, who in one scene tells the doctor, no one has ever believed me until now. Maybe you will understand me. As for understanding, how can the brain and AI help each other? How does the reality of sensory coupling in 4% of the population challenge both sides of that equation? If I project a digit in your peripheral vision, you can still make it out. But if I surround it by other digits, it becomes invisible, a phenomenon called masking. Now, remarkably, seats they can't see the number, but they say, well, it must be seven because I see green. They also have a speed advantage in visual searches. Hidden in this matrix of fives is a figure made of twos. It takes a while to find it, but synesthetes who see twos as differently colored than, than fives uh, quickly pick out the oddballs. These and similar results indicate that synesthesia occurs very early on in perception. When graphemes evoke color, the color area V4 lights up, as they say, but V4 is not the locus of synesthesia. It's one node of peak activation. Crosstalk exists in all brains, except most of us are unaware of it. An altered dynamic between excitation and inhibition brings that crosstalk to the surface in synesthetes. And synesthesia exists not in any one place, but as in an event-triggered dominant process in a distributed system. And network's unlit tissue still does, uh, shuttles all great deals of information. What's appealing about a distributed system is that several variables can be simultaneously mapped through a classically defined brain area while still preserving the area's topology. Systematic, lawful correspondences exist between aspects of conventional sentences. For example, both synesthetes and non-synesthetes say that louder tones are brighter than soft ones. Higher tones are smaller than low ones. Even smell maps to lightness and intensity, as both chefs and sensory psychologists know. A darkly tinted liquid tastes stronger than when it's pale. And white wine, surreptitiously colored red, tastes and smells like red wine. So. The senses are neither discrete nor compartmentalized, as standard models have them. What does it even mean, then, to hear, to see, or to categorize? How do you define a sense or reduce the sum to its parts when the parts are tightly interconnected with other modalities? If you blindfold sighted individuals for two days, the visual cortex responds to touch, sound, and spoken words. Remove the blindfold for just 12 hours, and V1 reverts back to recognizing visual input only. The brain's reversible ability to see this way with the fingers and ears depends upon connections from other senses that are already there but unused so long as vision inputs a signal. Brains didn't evolve logically. They accreted in a hodgepodge of whatever worked well enough to solve our distant ancestors' problems. Its organization is what I call multiplex. Early signal transduction uh, is relatively linear, but after reaching primary cortex at that horizontal line there, the pathways diverge, converge, and recurse in feed forward and feedback loops. As signals travel inward, <coughs> the distinction between what's motor and what's sensory is lost. The multiplex stream then reverberates back from hypothalamus to striatum and even the end organs. Sensory substitution illustrates these points about how the brain captures correspondences and assigns meaning. For instance, we normally think of the tongue as a taste organ, but loaded with touch receptors, the tongue is an excellent brain-machine interface. An electrode grid laid on its surface conveys a video stream of patterns of touch that users perceive in terms of visual attributes, such as distance, shape, direction, and uh, angle of movement. No practice is required to see this way. Both blind and blindfolded individuals can catch a ball or navigate an obstacle course immediately after inserting the tongue grid in their mouth. Nerve impulses from the eye are no different than those coming from the big toe. Just put the, feed in the information and the, 
brain sorts it out. The tongue array, available as a brain port, allowed a blind rock climber to, uh, to scale Mount Everest in 2001. It augments sighted individuals as well. Sonar signals fed into the tongue grid that divers essentially see in murky water. Infrared input gives soldiers 360 degree night vision. Its inventor attributes its mechanism to volume transmission. Volume transmission is a means of communication not yet modeled sufficiently by either neuroscientists or computer architects. By means of diffusion and convection, a wide assortment of hormones, peptides, ions, and gases act as information messengers, following energy gradients uh, in extracellular and cerebrospinal fluids. They're slow, operating in the minute to, to, uh, second to minute range, compared to the milliseconds of wire transmission. The latter is one to one. Volume transmission is one to many. If you think of signals along nerve fibers as a train going down a track, then volume transmission is the train leaving the track. No one has modeled this dimension yet, which makes one ask, is there perhaps a more fundamental way to rethink algorithms? Will developers with IBM's hardware substrate remap those already developed for conventional computers? And once brain-inspired computing transduces sense modalities into spikes, can the architecture enable recurrent networks to map themselves onto different modalities, affect, attention, and so forth? Most importantly, will its networks be flexible, overlap, and intersect the way they do in organic brains? The TED video said that synesthesia is overrepresented in creative individuals who excel at metaphor, a phenomenon I want to impress is much more than abstract language. In fact, it's quite the opposite, because synesthesia and metaphor both antedate language. Systematic similarities in perception, such as dark is strong, give way to synesthetic equivalences, such as I know it's two because it's white. These evolve into spatial metaphors, such as good is up, bad is down, or ontological metaphors, such as ideas are light. Language then further elaborates them into phrases such as, that was a bright idea, brilliant, or I see what you're saying. Much of our thinking is metaphorically structured, which others have shown is based on our interaction with the three-dimensional world. Perhaps evolution selects for synesthesia so strongly because its hyperconnectivity supports metaphor, which must be embodied if it's to be understood. Even four-year-olds understand synesthetic metaphors and metonymies. Perception appeals, uh, embodied perception appeals to both philosophy and neuroscience. An embodied brain is not a passive antenna, but an active explorer seeking out what interests it. It can't possibly take in the enormous holoflux that bombards it every second, so it has to be a strong filter, too. Consequently, it has its selective point of view, as we all do. The seven-year-old had a markedly different perspective than those of her playmates who thought she was weird. Compare the viewpoint of a Google Maps car that records everything indiscriminately as it drives down the street to the fact that two of us can walk down the same street and notice markedly different things with respect to shops, restaurants, and the people who pass us by. We have a different, a different point of view. We assign different values and salience to what we encounter. Watson and Google may well discover patterns in the big data that they vacuum up, but what if we could query the perspective of an autonomous machine and ask it, what is meaningful? What interests you, Robbie? What do you want? Of course, there's no reason a robot has to be anthropomorphic, as I was reminded <clears throat> on seeing IBM's tumbleweed uh, model, self-propelled search and rescue robot. I'm not sure how comfortable I'd be talking to a ball. Go fetch yourself, I suppose I could say. But when you think of it, <clears throat> this robot is as much embodied as, in its own way, as Robbie is. Embodied intelligences are not passive learners, as Heldon Haynes' famous gondola kitten showed back in 1963. Recently, an American child's Chinese-speaking nanny was videotaped so that a second child could see and hear exactly what the first one did. That second baby learned no Chinese, whereas the first one picked up an awful lot. Physical engagement, let it take in tone, gesture, the way they made eye contact, 
and the two-way emotional reading that neither side was cognizant of. So physically-based metaphoric thinking and embodied perception support one another. Synesthesia shows how memory, perception, and metaphor are related so that she had a green name makes sense. We understand cold heart without having to explicate the metaphor. And we refer to memory entirely in metaphoric images. With memory, storage is not so much a problem as retrieval is. It's not a fixed lookup table. Rather, embodied perception is colored by context. It's stored across the cortex in a rich web of associations and retrieved from cortex in yet other contexts. Each time we, we remember something, we remember it differently. It's a recollection of, and a reconstruction of salient and meaningful details of the original event, unavoidably shaded by context. All biologic memories are in some sense false. So it sounds Zen-like to say it, but it all is one. <clears throat> and yet, this is a story of difference, perspectives, attempts at understanding, and perhaps surprising outcomes. The seven-year-old girl who lost her friend went on to become a well-known artist exhibited around the world. The neighbor who tasted shapes went on to win a Tony Award. In his novel, Saturday, Ian McEwen writes, the brain's fundamental secret will be laid open one day, but even when it is, the wonder will remain. As to whether brain-inspired computing will illuminate humanity more than we illuminate it, I'll leave you with the closing words of Peter Brook's play, in which the synesthete wants to donate her brain to the doctor's institute. You could dissect it, she says. It might help you discover more about the secrets of the human brain. Don't you think so, doctors? Don't you think so? Thank you. <laughs>